Hey, how's it going? It's Keith Townsend from the CTOadvisor.com with another CTO dose. We're still here on the beautiful campuses of VMware. You, Paul, you guys are going to make me really jealous as I go back to Chicago. One, we don't have nearly as much green in our office space. <laughs> the campus is just is, is just beautiful. I even saw the turtle passing thing, which yeah. is notoriously a VMware specific thing. So I'm joined with Paul Fazon. GM of the cloud, cloud platform, cloud services, cloud native, which cloud, business? I am the general manager of the cloud native business unit here at VMware. So cloud native, we'll, we'll talk to the cloud services group in a little bit, mm -hmm. Milan and his, yep. his team. But talk to me, what is the role of the cloud native group mm -hmm. within VMware? Really simple, anything to do with containers falls into my group. So um, how we think about uh, supporting development teams wanting to work with containers, how we think about uh, monitoring applications that are deployed in containers, how we think about networking solutions around containers, security solutions, whether um, in the tr kind of more traditional sense with, uh, with SDN style networks, or in the future as you start to think about um, uh, services mesh and higher level networking services, all that kind of falls into the, the cloud native world here at VMware. So some of the products that fall on your group is VIC, VMware Inter mm -hmm. Integrated Containers. I was just at, at DockerCon Europe, talk to your team about the VMware's use cases in the Docker uh, API, mm -hmm. Docker Space, uh, PKS, which mm -hmm. we'll get into a little bit, and uh, is Python, is, is that part of your group, or is you guys just integrate with Python? Uh, Photon OS? I'm sorry, Photon. Photon, yeah. So Photon OS is a, uh, is a VMware homegrown Linux distribution. It now underpins uh, just about all of the VMware products in our portfolio, um, and it's also something that we're looking at using uh, with other products around the Dell Technologies family. It is, you know, straightforward. It's a, it is a lightweight, very modern Linux distribution. We've got um, very quick patching capabilities. Um, it allows us to control our own destiny so that when we need to hit a, a patch of security vulnerability, for instance, around vSphere in the, the distribution that it goes out on, it's quick and easy for us to do that without having to work with third parties to, to figure all that out. So dog fooding a little bit, if it's, if it's a VMware, uh, OVA, mm -hmm. then it's more than likely Photon, yeah. or it's on yeah. a path to become it is Photon. On a, largely speaking, today, most things are. There's a few cases um, where there are some things that happen in the data plane, like with NSX. Some of the elements of NSX aren't yet there, but they're, they're on a path to get there. So when I think about containers, I think Docker, Kubernetes, sure. even Mesos, Fear, yep. there's a ecosystem outside Cloud of Foundry here. uses Cloud Foundry, every, CNCF, yeah. there's you know, core OS, even competitors, Red Hat, you mm -hmm. know, the, but when I think of VMware and containers, mm -hmm. the the two don't meld. You know, I'm thinking about stateful workloads that are, that I need to vMotion stuff in and out of, mm -hmm. consistent databases, just an operating model that, you know, there's this whole pe pets versus cattle. I think about, when I think, think about VMware, whether it's myth or reality, I think about pets. So help dismiss that. Why, okay. why should people pay attention to VMware's cloud native story? So our customers are, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them out there, they live in a, uh, a multifaceted world, right? There is no, if I look at the, uh, an enterprise customer today, um, they've got applications running on systems that were originally thought of back in the 70s and 80s, sitting alongside applications that have just been modernized that are running in containers. Right. And our customers are looking for a common substrate, a common infrastructure service to run all of those all of those applications um, without having to reinvent the wheel each time a new abstraction gets defined. And so when you think about it, a container is a new type of virtualized workload. Um, you, you use the, the pets versus cattle analogy. Um, I think there's there's two ways of looking at that. There's the actual workload type and the the service that is actually exposed by the the infrastructure. Whether that infrastructure is a private cloud infrastructure or a public cloud infrastructure, I can guarantee you that our, our friends at uh, at Amazon, as an example, when they think about the EC2 control plane that uh -huh. they're using to service millions of customers around the world, 
the, it's not a pets versus cattle discussion with them. That is a very important, crucial element in their architecture. That's just, that used that's to serve just the foundation of, of EC2 right. is the foundation of their services. So similarly, when we talk about private cloud, for which VMware is the, the leading player in the, in the, uh, on the planet today, um, in the private cloud world, the private cloud control plane, which is largely grounded in vSphere, and you add NSX and vSAN or VMware Cloud Foundation overall, that is the control plane. That is our EC2 equivalent control plane for private cloud. So our customers have, they put a lot of um, dependencies on that to help them run their businesses. And so the things that sit on top of that, I think you can refer to as either pets or cattle, but that control plane itself is a very important part of how they run their business. And our approach to PKS, working collaboratively with, with Pivotal on this, this is a, a shared R&D project between Pivotal and VMware, um, is around bringing a Kubernetes solution to the VMware Cloud Foundation install base that exists on the planet today, um, and to allow customers to turn the question, a lot of times customers have, have started down the path of is it, con is it VMs or containers? It's not an or question, it's an and question. Mm -hmm. Every one of our customers has uh, application profiles going back 10, 20 years and will have those application profiles along for, around for a long time. So We need to take that and give them a continuum. So, so before can, we get started into yeah. the PKS discussion, let's talk about that initial foundation okay. or more that, that's built on vSphere and, and VMware core product suite, sure. NSX and included. I, I've gotten some flack about this comment maybe about two years ago. I said, you know what? A container sounds like the perfect workload to run inside of a VM. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, I don't care if it's bare metal, as if I'm a developer, I don't care if it's a bare metal uh, piece of infrastructure that my container is running on. I don't care if it's a virtual machine. Yeah, you have no, as long as it's friction free to the developer. Right, just as long I as care. I, the, back then, just as long as I could say Docker up yep. and pull my image and, right. and deploy my image. Great. The infrastructure, I don't care. I think that's bared out when you look at uh, Netflix. Mm -hmm. Netflix has their Titus uh, container, container orchestration that they built themselves. Mm -hmm. They said, you know what, the flexibility of building a VM, I mean, taking a VM-based infrastructure, in this, in this case, EC2, mm -hmm. and being able to carve up EC2 instances based on these smaller container instances has created a greater level of efficiency, even and translating to some real savings mm -hmm. for their cloud-based infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some validity in saying, you know what, this isn't a VM versus container conversation. There's, this is a VM and container conversation. For us, at the VMware foundation level, it's how do you allow customers and their development teams, right? IT exists to serve developers. Developers exist to serve the line of business, which serves to... Uh, which exists to serve customers, ultimately, end right. customers, right? So if you think about that food chain, um, our, our VMware Cloud Foundation is being uh, has been developed and it continues to evolve to enable IT to best serve developers in a private cloud environment and expanding into a hybrid cloud environment with our VMC offering. Um, if I think about, you know, there are certainly companies out there that have the deep technical expertise and the chops to build this themselves and open source some projects and make it available for others to take advantage of. But as we've seen in, in the past, I won't, there's a number of projects you can point to, but just because something's open source doesn't mean it is straightforward and easy for an enterprise customer to, to deploy and to operationalize. Kelsey, one of the most popular books in Kubernetes space is Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way. Mm -hmm. So let me learn how to do Kubernetes from the bolts and pieces of taking a the downstream project and just deploying that. So let's talk about the competitive landscape as we okay. move into PKS. Okay. You know, I look at Kubernetes. There's no limit to the number of companies that's telling me that they can manage Kubernetes for yes. me. From Docker to Red Hat to Nomada to there's there's a ton of ton companies mm -hmm. that can manage Kubernetes for me. Yep. So they can take that, put it on top of VMware vSphere's base infrastructure and manage that. Yep. Where is VMware adding value where these other players can? Um, and a number of fronts. Um, number one, um, we are going to deliver, custom, this will bear out with our customers over time, so I'm excited to let them do the talking for me uh, as we get into this year. Um, but 
first and foremost, no one is going to be able to integrate Kubernetes into vSphere as deeply as VMware can, right? And so I go back to that, oh, is it an or comment or an and comment between VMs and containers? It's an and comment. And so we're going to make it as easy on vSphere to serve up a Kubernetes cluster as you can get a VM today. Right? So, and so to an IT administrator mm -hmm. uh, looking to service different lines of business, different development teams, to be able to have choices of these different tools on one platform is incredibly valuable. So let's talk about that from a practical level. Mm -hmm. I'm a VMware administrator. Mm -hmm. A developer has come to me and says, you know what, I want containers mm -hmm. and uh, I want to build a production app based on containers. Mm -hmm. I panic because I'm thinking, you know what, I have to go out and create a, a, a Docker host and then I have to take a Kubernetes, I have to put that inside of a Kubernetes cluster and then I have to manage that separate from my vSphere environment. Completely different but, landscape. But why? Because that's what the industry is telling me I have to do. That's that's bare Docker containers have to be on bare metal. So let's, and, let's, let's, let's unpack that a little bit because um, it's interesting. So all of the, the biggest public cloud providers on the planet, their container offerings all land in VMs. Yes. Number one, point number one. Point number two, um, and I put vSphere's uh, DRS, dynamic resource scheduling, up against uh, uh, resource scheduling in any other platform on the planet right now in terms of private cloud or operating systems. It is, it is um, not only the most efficient in the world, it's been designed in partnership with many of the, with the leading uh, x86 chip vendors uh, on the planet to make best use of the hardware, x86 hardware that's available today. So we can take advantage of your hardware resources better than bare metal, right? And we've got some studies out there, some studies out there that to actually demonstrate those points. Um, and then the third point I'd bring up, I go back to the, the, the first argument I made is that customers don't want to stand up independent silos for a new, just to deliver a new abstraction. They want their infrastructure service to support multiple abstractions. Otherwise, you're reinventing compute, you're reinventing networking, you're reinventing security, you're reinventing compliance, auditing, monitoring, logging. The list goes on and on. It's, it's absolutely absurd and insane to think real enterprise customers at scale are going to replicate all this over and over again just because an abstraction changes. And so you're saying two months down the road or two quarters down the road, they're going to do it again for serverless and for functions? It's, it's crazy. Right. Um, and most customers, uh, what I'm seeing play out in most customers is that the initial container exploration and adoption starts with um, a, a very forward-looking group that has been given very limited resources and they have to go out and kind of figure out how to get this stood up quickly and easily for, in their world and make it work just for their one project. But the next step after that is, how do I make this work for the 95% of my, my installation, my 95% of my data centers? And that always comes back to the typical enterprise checklist of things that have to be accommodated um, to, to most adequately support their business. And so, I'm, um, I have the conversation about bare metal with customers quite a bit, um, and when we point out um, some of the things that they're going to ultimately bump up against, um, it, it usually comes back to a, 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 a little bit of a smile and a, yeah, not, okay, not we quite, get it. Not, not a quite, I told you so, but... Uh, yeah, no, I'm I told not, you not so. trying to, this yeah. is not, a, and I told you, this is simply a, listen, there's virtualization, vSphere-based virtualization is better than hardware today. It's better than bare metal today so, because it takes such good advantage of that underlying infrastructure. Let's, I would imagine, I'm, I'm not a PKS ex expert, but if I was running a VMware vSphere environment, mm. I would want to say, I look at something like a Kubernetes and cluster management yep. and, cl and workload placement. Yep. And I think to myself, you know what? That sounds a little bit like and maybe be a little bit less capable than DRS. When I think of DRS and automatic workload redistribution, redistribution, the vast majority of container workloads are still legacy applications that have been repackaged. Yes. They're still pets. They might be in a container format. Well, but there's, a, the, there's a couple of trends emerging. There are there are um, traditional applications that have been repackaged. Right. And the, the end result is the, the operator of that around that application gets the efficiency gains of working in a, in a containerized environment versus an operating system environment, exactly. which is awesome. But then there's also the second emerging trend around um, ISV package software and some middleware package software yes. that is, um, you know, if you think about, a, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, if you go back a little ways and you remember the traditional three-tiered application yes. architectures, the web front end, you've got your middleware, your, your database on the back end and how that was all networked and firewalled together with load balancers at every layer, um, people are now 
you know, a lot of the app customization started and containerization started with the web front end because that's right. what customers see. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you Easy look, at, scale if you look at, like my favorite example is, is um, looking at Amazon's website and you as you load a product page, you can see all the different microservices running inside of that page, right? It's a really right. good, it's how I explain microservices to my mom. Um, but beyond that, as you get deeper into the package software, the middleware, and then some of the data services on the back end, um, you know, they, they're not as, um, uh, what's the word? They're not as, um, they require a little bit more care and feeding, right, candidly. And so we're seeing that emerge as kind of a new class of, uh, of application components that will land in PKS. And so we're taking a lot of care to work with a, number, a growing number of ISV partners to make sure that their solutions, even though they're, they're packaging and testing on generic Kubernetes, that we do some further testing with them in a, in a PKS environment on top of our VMware Cloud Foundation, much like VMware did from the other side with our hardware partners, with our hardware compatibility uh, list, which is still industry leading after you know 20 years uh, of existence, is still by far industry leading compared to any other infrastructure platform out there. We're taking that similar approach now with ISVs in terms of certifying them through our PKS offering. And so you'll see that start to come out a lot more. So uh, a basic question, can, Let's say that I have a traditional application, mm -hmm. or even one of these newer applications. They're long run, running containers. They, they're, they're state, they, the containers will run for days or months. Mm -hmm. Can DRS take that containerized application mm -hmm. and move it to another workload as demand for a single host accelerates? Like, do I still get the, the functionality of something like a DRS even though I'm running the workload in a container that PKS is managing? We give you the, so the short answer is yes, we give you the tools to do what is best for your applications. And I, like I said before, I think VMware and vSphere does that better than any infrastructure compute platform on the planet. Um, how you use that, customers are still figuring out how they want to use the tools that are available on a VMware virtualized infrastructure for their app modernization processes. A lot of times, just like with the earlier days of DRS, customers started with it turned on to tell me what to do, but don't do it for me. Exactly. Mode, right? I forget right. what the, the, the exact name of it was. Manual but, or something. Right. That, right. And, and, and over Suggested. time, they gradually turned that dial up so that DRS started doing more and more for them in an automated fashion. With containers, with containerized applications, you know, a lot of people are when they want to take the conservative approach. Okay, let's start. What would you suggest we do? And let's over time they'll dial that okay. up. And I, I think that's just part of the learning process for enterprise customers as they're going through how to best make use of the technologies that are now available in our private cloud environments. So, Paul, I really enjoyed the conversation. Are you guys going to be at Dell Technologies World in a few months? We are going to be all over the place over the next few months. We've got uh, we're going to be at Dell Technologies World. We're going to be there's a number of container related shows that we're doing. Um, there's a shout out to the open source community. We got the open source uh, leadership summit up in uh, up in Sonoma uh, next nice. week. Um, so we'll be we'll be up there. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, uh, next few months, excuse me. Um, but you're going to see us, you know, uh, you're going to see us uh, showing up in a lot of places. So Paul, with that, I'd like to thank you for joining the CTO Dose. I'd love to actually talk about community and a bunch of other aspects of what it means for a large enterprise service provider and technology company, et cetera, such as VMware, to get involved in something as community driven as it is as Kubernetes, mm -hmm. that by itself could probably it's be a whole other session. Happy That's to a whole other session, but I really appreciate you okay. talking and clearing up some of the myths and truths about PKS. You want to find out more about uh, VMware Cloud native offerings? I'm assuming there's a website. There the is. Um, I'll get you the we'll get you the link you can but I'll put it the in bottom. the show notes. Yeah. But other than that, you can obviously go to VMware.com. I think under products and BUs you can find the cloud native group. Until then, talk to you next CTO dose. Uh, stay tuned. More coverage from VMware's campus where we're going to talk to the cloud services group, understand the difference between the cloud native group, cloud services, and what that has to offer enterprise VMware customers. Talk to you next CTO Dose. Follow us on the web, thectoadvisor.com, me on Twitter, at CTO Advisor.